This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1005, recorded on May 5th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Luckily, my phone just refreshed because it still was saying it was 38 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's 69 degrees Fahrenheit now and uh, mostly sunny. And if I go to your rain Norwegian weather app, that will tell me it's 20 degrees Celsius. Here it is 17C and mostly cloudy. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. Um, today it is 61 Fahrenheit here, and I know from Kathy that means it's 16 Celsius. Um, and it is mostly cloudy here um, as well. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, 58 Fahrenheit, 14C, mostly cloudy, and we appear to be coming to the end of this week of rain that we've had off and on. Yeah. So looking forward to a nice sunny weekend. So yesterday was May 4th, and Daniel's episode was 1004. Uh, today is May 5th, and it's 1005. Very easy for me to remember both the episode and the date. <laughs> and by the way, Kathy, this is interesting for you. <clears throat> I got an email this week from someone who said, you shouldn't put a, th a comma uh, in a thousand. You should only put a comma after f five digits or something. So he doesn't want commas. And you shouldn't say 1,000 and one. You should say 1,001. Hmm. How mm -hmm. about that? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So at I what point I, do we go to 1005 or to, uh, <laughs> like episode 1030? 11, or, probably. Yeah, probably. I think I think the 2000s went to that when we got to like what, 2010, 20, 2010, 11 or 2010. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we were doing 2001. Because you did 21 sounds weird because you don't or know. 2001 what it is. or yeah. yeah 2001. But I tended to say 2001, not. 2000 and one. Oh, yeah. you were right huh. then. Okay. Yeah, I, I was taught yeah, I, not to not put the and in either. I well, you think you I should have corrected me. I've been saying end. it for years. Or not for years, I guess. Not 995. Now, only because of the thousand do we, are we doing it now. So I'll try and remember. 1001, 1002, <laughs> 1010, 1000. We'll release one episode per second. 1005. <laughs> so here's the thing. If you want to stay in sync with the date, we have to release an episode every day. Every day. Yes. <laughs> And that's it'll only work through the end of May. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. So it's not worth it for that. No. Anyway. It's too much anyway. All right. We have a bunch of uh, announcements for you. Uh, so let's start with Kathy f with ASV. Okay. We're past the early bird registration deadline. We had a huge number of registrations come in. This could be a really big meeting, but we're not sure yet. <laughs> because there's less time be this year between early bird registration ending and the actual meeting. Mm. So if there were as many as last year, it would be a huge meeting. Maybe it'll just be a very big meeting. That's exciting. But now that you've already registered, most of you, uh, you can still register for satellite symposia at no registration cost penalty. And I just want to remind you that once you're registered for a satellite, you can attend talks at any of them. And we haven't really done a dive into any of them, but I want to tell you about the phage fought the cells and the phage one. It's going to have some cool participants. One of them is a, a later edition replacement, and that's Stephanie Strafty. She's an epidemiologist and author of the book, The Perfect Predator, in which she tells the story about how she organized a team that found bacteriophage to treat the antibiotic-resistant Acinetobacter baumani infection that nearly killed her husband, Tom Patterson. So she's going to be there. Yes. Astute TWIV listeners will remember that we heard this story from two of the key phage scientists, Ra Young and Jason Gill, uh, at College Station, Texas, TWIV 502, Texas Road Phage. Also, her book mentions the contributions of Forrest Rower, who's been on TWIV 391 and 70, 732, 
and he will be in that same satellite symposium. And another phage satellite symposium participant is Graham Hatfield, who's been on 87. So you'll hear lots of TWIV connections if you go to that satellite. Mm. So uh, and just one more, more announcement for this time, and I'll probably try and say it every time or ask you to say it when I'm not here, Vincent. And that is we're being uh, friendly to the planet. And the neck pouch that you got last year with your name tag in it, you're supposed to save and bring back. So if you can find that, hopefully you just put it in your suitcase and it'll come along with you. That will be great. <laughs> we'll have them there, but um, we are hoping that we can not have everybody have to get a new one of those every year and just throw them in landfills and things like that. If you don't have the one from ASV last year, could you substitute one from another conference? Because that's a pretty common conference thing, right? Yes, I, I think you you could. People might, it might become a topic of conversation. But sure, yeah, yes, depending on what it. conference it's from. When, <laughs> when you mentioned this, I started looking for it for mine from last year. And I have not yet found last year's, but I think I found like 2018. Part of me was like, maybe I could be tw uh, ASV 2018. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I, Why not? Yeah, yeah. I have a bunch. I usually hang them on something, a doorknob, until they get too many. A lot of I, people do that. Then yeah. I throw them yeah. away, and um, I probably still have a bunch. Yeah, so yeah. I'll bring mine. Um, yeah. So if if it were really a big meeting, how many people would it be? Eighteen hundred to two thousand. You can accommodate two thousand people, huh? Oh yeah, yes. The venue wow. can accommodate it. Uh, no, hotels, no. Uh, almost. I think now people are have bought up most of the room blocks, and so people are going to have to just yeah. be going on their own. Yeah, I booked mine this week. I got it. All okay. right. Um, uh, one more announcement. Uh, Amy Rosenfeld is back looking for a technician. So here's the story. The Rosenfeld Laboratory, it's in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Review at the FDA. Uh, they are studying antroviruses, and the research assistant will work on antroviruses, uh, a variety of studies. One of them is understanding the, the meaning of cross-species anti-antrovirus antibodies. So you will do experiments in cell culture, and you'll also help develop small animal models for studying infections caused uh, by these antroviruses, and it will all be BSL-2. And I will put a link in the show notes. Uh, to a, a more description and, and an email for Amy where you can reach her. And now one more from uh, Alan. He has a follow-up. Oh, yes. So I got an email um, after uh, TWIV 999. Um, so, dear TWIV, for the past three years, I've listened to every episode of TWIV and have provided my friends, family, and neighbors the most cu current and research-based information about the COVID-19 pandemic. Initially, I tuned in to the press conferences at Evergreen Healthcare in Washington as well and took copious notes. My community looks to me for information and support regarding their health issues. Uh, and you'll understand why in a moment. I am writing in response to TWIV episode 999 in the discussion regarding the STAT article and the role of MDs commenting on virology. At 18 minutes, 12 seconds, Alan Dove's comment must have been an unintended error that MDs have the unique credibility, quote, not the first nurse you see when you walk into the hospital. I am a registered nurse with over 50 years experience in healthcare. Our role function in every patient encounter is to provide educational information and to empower our patients in their healthcare choices. We are often not given credit for our important role in the healthcare system. Please do not dis discount our unique credibility and instead be curious about our role, which is the most trusted profession. And she gives a link to back that up. Alan, please correct your error. Thank you, Bonnie Robb, uh, who points out that she could be your first nurse. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is a product of my kind of inverse monkeys and typewriter thing, where if I say enough words, eventually I will put together an abominably stupid phrase, and this is one of them. Um, that was a, absolutely an unintended error. I don't know where that came from, uh, and I apologize for it. Uh, what I was trying to express is that people's Personal doctors who they have an established relationship with uh, do have a unique level of credibility, not only as representatives of the healthcare system, but also as somebody who you've known for a number of years. And, oh, this is Dr. Smith who, you know, keeps track of my blood pressure. Um, I will take virology advice from that person. Uh, so that was the only thing I was trying to express. 
Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Nurses are appropriately a very trusted profession. All right. I, I, I got a similar email. I don't know if it was from Bonnie or someone else. Yeah. I, I, and, and I'm sure there were many others who were thinking the same thing yeah. and cringing when I said that. And, and I, I now cringe having that quoted back to me. God, I said that. So sorry. It looks to me like you can take a bus to the FDA White Oak campus. For instance, I finally figured out a way to get the map to show it to me if I put in <laughs> Washington Monument, and it would take an hour and 15 minutes by bus to go from the Washington Monument to FDA. Don't live at the Washington Monument. No, but the rooms are too small. I, put, I put in like, you know, Smithsonian and that didn't work. And I put in Museum right. of Natural History and it picked, and I thought I was picking the one in DC and it picked one in Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh, what a mess. So maybe you but, could take a bus from a metro stop. Yeah. Yes, that's what I mean. Right, you so you yeah. don't have to take a bus. To I people mean, who are interested in that research assistant you can, position. I, you can probably it. find something. I, I don't know that area of Maryland very well, but there's, uh, you can probably find some living accommodations. Right. All right. Uh, now on to the literature. We have a snippet in a paper, and this snippet is a challenge. I, we will try to make it understandable, <laughs> even though I had some trouble understanding it myself. <laughs> So we'll, we will give you this summary. The topic is as vast as an ocean. Indeed, is as vast as an ocean. Um, do you want to give us a lay summary to begin with, Kathy? I would love that. First of all, the title of the paper, which is in Nature, is Mirus Viruses Link Herpes Viruses to Giant Viruses. Okay, and we can go over the authors. Uh, we can go over them now. I'll just have to put my glasses on. Uh, uh, Gaia Meng Pelletier Forter, Vani Fernandez Guerra, Hailan Winker Ogata, Kupovich, and Delmont. And I probably really messed most of those up. But there's some from France and Japan. And, and it looks like we have Germany. Two, the, the first two, Gaia and Meng, are co, -fir, co first authors. Right. Right. It's an okay. appropriate name, Gaia, for this, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Gaia came up with the hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, Maris viruses link herpes viruses to giant viruses. Okay. So, we're going to learn what that link might be. So, first of all, big picture, there are four realms of viruses. Two, the first two, um, we're not even going to talk about anymore. Those are the single strand DNA realm and the RNA virus realm. Okay, then there's two realms of double-strand DNA viruses, and they're categorized based on their structure uh, of their major capsid protein, which is a coat protein, in other words. And so there's the group called the Duplo DNA viria, or Dupadna viria, and that includes herpes viruses and tailed bacteriophages. And then there's the um, Viridna viria, which comes from various VAR DNA viruses. Okay, viridinavirus, viria. Okay, and that includes things like adenos, pox virus, a lot of marine viruses, and the giant viruses, which we're going to probably be using the word nucleocytovaricota for the giant viruses, or that's what we mean when we say giant viruses. Okay, so one thing is that there's a discontinuity in the complexity between the this uh, Viridna viria and particularly within that group between the viruses that are less than 50 kilobases and the large giant viruses, large and giant viruses like pox and the even more giant viruses. Okay. So there's a, there's kind of a gap in genome size. Right. A and complexity. And, complexity, and how many right. genes they mm -hmm. they encode and things they can do because of that. So in this paper, they're going to discover a way that sort of fills in some of that gap. Um, but it's very interesting because it's not really within that group of Viridna viria. It's in the other realm, the Duplodna viria. Yeah. And so... I was going to say, I think one of the things that is always really interesting to me is I often, you know, because I do not spend as much time thinking about double strand DNA virus phylogeny. Um, you know, I think a lot of, about a lot of these viruses 
together. Um, and I do sometimes think of the the Mimi viruses and the, the viruses that are the giant nucleoside DNA viruses that, that Kathy mentioned. Um, and I also know that, you know, we've got the pox viruses and the adenoviruses and the herpes viruses. And if you look at this grouping that Kathy mentions, you've got those giant DNA viruses that infect amoeba, pox and adeno on one side, and you've got herpes on the other side. Mm. And that... Good in and of itself seems like a weird distinction. Um, if I were going to guess the distinction based on my knowledge just as a biologist, that maybe wouldn't have been what I would have guessed. Yeah. Right. That's a good yeah. Point. I would have right. thought that the adenos and maybe into the herpes viruses would be one group and then mm -hmm. the the pox and into the giant viruses just grouping by size. Right. Right. But it's based on these uh, features of their capsid slash coat proteins. So what they did was survey five oceans and two seas, and they surveyed what they call the sunlit oceans, which means the top 200 meters of the ocean, that which can still be penetrated by sunlight. I had to look that up because I thought the sunlit oceans was a weird Phrase. I thought it was it was such a romantic thing to come across. In the, we it's surveyed the, uh, the sunlit oceans. I'm like, oh man, I'd like to survey the sunlit oceans. The photic zone, right? The, the euphotic it's the zone. zone. Yes, the euphotic zone. zone. Oh, it's mm -hmm. euphotic, so, not photic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Five oceans, and I, I mean, this is this is a lot. Uh, yeah. The top 200 meters of yeah, the, it's a lot. The North Atlantic, South we'll Atlantic, talk about North that. Pacific, we'll, South. Like, right. wow! <laughs> right. I know. I was, I was very excited about the sunlit oceans, and then I saw the photic <laughs> zone, and I was like, oh right, I've heard about the yeah, yeah. photic yeah. zone. I okay. think that's, that right. that seems much less exciting. The top, than the, the top ocean. few inches is very exciting because it would be fun to float <laughs> there, but not yeah. 200 meters <laughs> down. No, no, not 200 meters. I'm not even going to scuba dive that deep. Right. No. So, in doing this survey, they identified the Miris viruses, and Miris comes from the word strange in latin uh, and so uh they infect plankton now i thought i better really know what plankton are well it turns out i may be mistaken but from reading wikipedia plankton is kind of a catch-all term mm. for stuff that mostly <laughs> is carried along by wave or water motion it doesn't have its own propellant so even things like jellyfish could count as plankton, mm. which I found kind of strange. But yeah, I think there are certain size categories. There are. It's it's all in Wikipedia. So you found um, it mirus. Yeah, I found yes. it mirus. It was yes. very mirus. It was very mirus. Right. Okay. So these they found a huge number of these viruses that can infect plankton, and so turns out one of the side benefits of this work is that it fills a gap in understanding something about plankton uh, evolution, uh, that most plankton evolution or some plankton evolution may evolve by gene flow. Okay. But the biggest- And by stealing the Krabby Patty secret formula. Right. <laughs> right. One of the, Sorry, the most- had to get that in there. Right. One of the most strange thing about these Miris viruses is that they have Properties that are like the herpes virus, uh, virus, the herpes viruses, which are in one realm, and like the giant viruses, which are in a different realm. Mm. So that's the strangest thing because down from realm, the next thing is uh, kingdom, and down from kingdom is phylum. And so they talk about this. It, all through this paper in, in terms of phyla. And they look at the phyla of the giant viruses, which are in one realm, and the phyla of the uh, duplodna viruses, which are in the other, which is the other realm. And, and they make their comparisons at the phylum level. So two levels down from realm. And the fact that these viruses have characteristics of both makes them kind of bridge this gap. And I think maybe I've said enough <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for my general thing. Hopefully I haven't lost everybody. No, I, so this, is, this looks like a missing link between yeah. the herpes viruses and the giant viruses. I think that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know, the thing is you have to look and then you'll find if you have gaps, it means you haven't looked enough probably. 
right? And that's kind of the take home message here is that yeah, exactly. Right. When you hear what they had to do, um, it was a lot of work. And if you're missing something, it's probably because you haven't looked hard enough. So the story here is, yeah, they went looking and they found they filled in that gap, and there's more filling in to do for sure. Um, yeah, and in fact, they're not even sure how these viruses came about. And we'll get to that later. But as I got to the end of the introduction, I thought, why don't they think this is in its own realm? (laughs) You know, but no, they just, they think it's within the Duplodna uh, Viria realm, even though it's got a lot of properties and gene things that make it like that other realm. We actually have a long email from Jens Kuhn about realms. I don't know if we'll get to it today. I was going to say, maybe they didn't put it in its own realm because they didn't want to get an email from Jens Kuhn about that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, or, so I, yeah. I found a nice figure in, in the ICTV, the International Committee for the Taxonomy of Viruses, ictv.org, uh, has a nice figure which uh, shows what Kathy has been referring to, right? The top level classifier, this realm, it, and each of them has a slightly different suffix so that you can distinguish them, right? So the realms have viria. So it's riboviria, for example. Then we have kingdoms, orthornaviria, viria, sorry, viria. Then the phyla are viricotas, which sounds like food to me, viricota. (laughs) Ricotta. Then we have classes, which are viricites, and orders are virales. And then... I get into a comfortable area. The families are viridi. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I grew up with that. That's about right. when I start understanding this, yes. And right. the genus is virus and the species is also virus. And, and for people who <laughs> have thought about other types of biological entities or different types of organisms, these are the same classification groups mm-hmm. except for realm. So when we think about um, cellular life, we put domain in that same place, but other than domain, these are exactly the same things that you may have learned about in the past about King Philip came over from Germany Saturday, among many other mnemonics. Yeah, Girl Scout Volleyball gives you variety. There there are a bunch of different ones. (laughs) Wow, I never did that. I just memorized King of Final Class Order, Family, Genus, Species. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, no, I I can tell you quite a few. um, The one that I remember the the best is King Philem came over from Germany or King Philip came over from came Germany. Over Saturday. From Germany. Okay. So realm is the same as domain. Domain is in the same location uh-huh. um, when you're thinking about um, cellular life. So okay. the only dom- the domains for cellular life are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Yeah. Got it. All right. So, so uh, Kathy gave you the background. There's a gap uh, between these, um, <clears throat> The uh, Duplodnaviridae, the Viria, right? And the Viridnaviria. And so they wanted to fill it in. So how you fill it in by looking at more sequences. And here you have to look in the oceans. And there was a really interesting ocean exploration expedition done uh, between 2009 and 2013 called the Tara Oceans Expedition. And I found a really cool graphic that tells you what they did and where they went. So there's a map of the world showing where they went. Um, It's a long expedition. This was quite a voyage. Quite a voyage. On an extremely well-equipped sailboat. This looks really, (laughs) really, really cool. And they would um, sample with nets of different sorts, with bottles that go on to different depths that open up and collect uh, water at different depths. Uh, and then they uh, they're, they're looking for different life forms, and they keep the water. It's all stored. And well, actually, they uh, I'm not sure what they keep, but I know that at periods they would come into port and send the samples to labs for further analysis. And so you could have, for example, uh, DNA sequences of ev- metagenomes of everything at every depth level that you wanted. Right? It could be really. And these 200, I think they just did 200 meters or so, right, on this uh, trip. I can't see this. Uh, I think that's image. right. But you'd, uh, you'd have to you'd have to set a cutoff somewhere because, I mean, there's yeah. not enough space on this boat for all the cable you would need for the Challenger Deep, probably. So they would, all this DNA sequence 
uh, is in public databases. So you can access it and uh, analyze it as you wish. It's really uh, a very good uh, service. The, the graphic explores all of this. It's really, really good. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. So they have uh, uh, 798 metagenomes, which means I don't know the, how they if they pooled any of these, but a metagenome is a, is all the sequences from an environmental sample, basically, and this is amounts to 280 billion reads, with uh, which made 12 million contigs longer than 2,500 bases. So a contig is when you take these sequencing methods generally give you shorter sequence runs, and you can computationally overlap them by finding the homologies. And then sometimes you can assemble long contigs, which could be a virus or something else, right? So 2,500 bases or longer. And then they, they uh, you know, some of them are planktons and, and some of them have other eukaryotes and they looked in them for viruses. And so how do you do that? Uh, you look for a conserved protein. And what they used was uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, two different subunits. A and B, uh, and these, uh, they say, are informative gene markers that happen in all the known DNA viruses, including those that infect uh, marine eukaryotes. So you can just look for a signature of that gene, and you can say, ah, this probably is, uh, is, is uh, viral. So they did that, and it, the end result, and I won't bring you through the, the details, mostly because I don't understand them myself. <laughs> But, well, and also this paper is open access. If you really yeah, want to really dig want into it, it yes. um, you can. But uh, they they end up finding uh, some uh, a new what they call monophyletic viral clade uh, with several hallmark genes uh, related to but distinct from those in the known nucleocytoviricota. <laughs> nucleocytoviricota, which would that sounds be, delicious. It does sound very, <laughs> which would be a phylum, right? Mm -hmm. Viricota. So they call those uh, the Miras viruses, as Kathy said. Miras is surprising or strange. And um, this is where it gets interesting because they this uh, uh, this Miras these Miras viruses don't have anything that looks like the nucleocytoviricota virion module, like the, the major capsid protein. It's not there. Uh, instead, they have a capsid protein. It, it's distantly related to um, a capsid protein called HK97 fold, which is a common fold among many uh, capsid proteins. Uh, and it's shared with the herpes virales and the cordovirocetes. Uh, the the cordovirocetes, if I'm not mistaken, it's got Failed phage. phages. Yeah. So the HK57 fold was originally found in phages. And then, oh, look, it's also in herpes viruses. That's cool. So um, these Miras viruses, then you put them in the Duplodna viria, uh, but they have not got the right capsid thing. And looking at the structures, um, they find um, key parts of what they call the virion module, uh, which would be things involved in DNA replication and DNA packaging and capsid maturation and so forth. So um, this, they say this, um, the, the nature of the capsid proteins and represent and hallmarks pointing to a closer evolutionary relationship between Miras viruses and herpes viruses. Okay. So that's the key. These are related to herpes viruses. Now, um, they look at, you can look at all the different genes in here. Um, the 22, the Miras viruses contain 22,000 plus genes and they do all kinds of things. Uh, you know, DNA replication, transcription, proteases, protein degradation, and so forth, cell growth. They say, thus Miras viruses encode an elaborate toolkit that could enable fine tuning the cell biology and energy potential of their hosts for optimal virus replication. Um, and, and, um, many, many of these are involved in DNA replication, uh, these functions. Um, all right. So they, these are, these are abundant. They find, um, Miras viruses in 
131 out of the 143 Terra Ocean stations. So the station, I think, is when they they stopped and they right. delivered their, their samples for sequencing. One sampling point. So from pole to pole. So it's all over the ocean. Um, and in fact, the percentage is very high, too. At, percentage comes later, I think. In the Once you know where to look, it's everywhere. And so they say these are among the most abundant eukaryotic viruses characterized so far in the sunlit oceans. And as Kathy said, they're active within plankton. So, oh, here we go. So uh, the, the Mimi virus uh, re- genes, which the Mimi viruses, which contain three point, did I say Mimi? <laughs> I meant Miris. M- Miris. They contain 3.8% of genes in the global um, database made by this uh, voyage represent 13% of the transcriptomic signal. So it's a lot. And they say that uh, that's because they're abundant um, as well. Um, so they, abund- they actively infect marine unicellular eukaryotes in both temperate and polar waters. So then they said, all right, maybe we made some mistakes, so let's do it again. <laughs> so they, they used, they made a, um, a sequence that they said we're going to look in additional databases to find more of these things. Uh, and they they looked in one from the Mediterranean Sea and they find a near complete genome, a near complete genome, the whole thing, not just a contig, that uh, perfectly has this, this virion module trait shared only between the Miris and the herpes virus. So this unusual capsid structure, the HK97, it's got the whole thing, plus it's got the informational module, the, the DNA replication and everything else that's shared between the Miras viricota and the nucleocyto viricota. Again, the viricota are the phyla. So um, based on the virion module, these viruses belong to Duplodna viriae, but the whole mark genes put them in the phylum nucleocyto viricota. Uh, and so this is interesting. And they say this, this informational module began either in giant viruses or Miris viruses, and then was transferred between the two realms during the evolution. So this is a pretty cool way to fill that gap <laughs> between. There's a, there's a really nice figure about that in figure four yeah. that mm-hmm. I thought was really helpful. Yeah. It shows their ideas of how these arose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, that's the new, new, new set of viruses. They di- differ from all previously characterized groups of viruses, uh, and they um, seem to be between. You know, there are links between, basically, as the title says, uh, herpes viruses and giant viruses, um, which is pretty cool. So basically, you know, the ancestor of herpes viruses uh, came from the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not surprising when you consider how old herpes viruses appear to be and that they're widespread in yeah. both aquatic and land life. Yeah. They say the Miras, Among eukaryotes. Miras viruses point to a planktonic ancestry for herpes viruses, uh, which lost a lot of genes because... Uh, the the other viruses are much bigger. They lost genes and sp- became specialized to infecting animal cells. And you know, so, a re- I mean, there's there's a lot of ideas that like retroviruses probably originated in the oceans as well, and then they came onto land when what the some of the animals came back. Right. Yeah. When the right. when <clears throat> people came or the animals came back onto land because there were plants there, and they brought. Yeah. The vi- their viruses with them, including retroviruses mm-hmm. and maybe herpes viruses as well, right? So what came back on land? What kind of, uh, were, th- were they fishes or mammals that came back, do you know? No, I think they were sort of reptile amphibians. Okay. Yeah, they so were- the, the, um, the lung fishes um, and uh, coelacanth are, are sometimes put forward as, because they've, they've got the skeletal structure, the tetrapod structure that suggests they could could have maybe... Sure slipped up onto land of modern coelacanths or deep water species, but, um, and they, they have a, a sort of a proto lung mm. that suggests maybe that's a common, <clears throat> maybe they have a common ancestor with whatever it was that first 
discovered or or had the evolutionary breakthrough that getting up onto land had some advantages and there was no competition. You know, mm. you could eat all these plants. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was pre-mammal. It was pre-mammal. Definitely, definitely pre-mammal. So basically they brought into land these viruses with them. Yes. And then they infect other animals and they diversify and then that's the how The animals get- diversify and their viruses diversify yeah. with them. It's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So I just want to make clear that they kind of talk about two gaps. One is the gap between the tailed phages, the caudovirale, caudo, caudo, caudovir, whatever the ending is, <laughs> cota, I don't know, and the herpes, all yeah. within the duplodnas. And so there's a gap there because the, the, uh, and then there's also a gap between the large giant viruses, large and giant viruses in the viridnaviria, mm-hmm. which includes things like adeno, pox, all the way up to giant viruses. So there's, there's gaps that in both of those kinds of places where this might start to fill things in. But this idea of which set of genes went from which virus group to the other is an open question. Right. And and one thing that's also really interesting that I think people should remember is that they are hypothesizing that some of these genes came from coevolution with a proto-eukaryote. Um, so the viruses have picked some of these up potentially from some mm-hmm. eukaryote that they infected, perhaps. Right. Right. So, so a really uh, kind of understated statement is the discovery of Miris viricota is a reminder that we have not yet grasped the full ecological and evolutionary complexity of even the most abundant double-stranded DNA viruses yeah. in key ecosystems such as the surface of our oceans and seas. So I, I think we didn't even know that these were the most abundant eukaryotic no. viruses. No. So Well, and if you think about this, this is the sunlit ocean. I think it's probably the minority of the ocean. <laughs> By volume, um, yes. Yes. Yeah, there's more down yeah. below for sure. Exactly. So they're, we're, we're, they're just, in fact, scratching the surface of the ocean. Yeah. And I mean, we need these expeditions, right? This one was a shared expedition, but many people do their own. Um, you know, I, I know I'm going to a, a aquatic virus workshop in Quebec in a couple of weeks and those individuals go out on their own boats, with sh- which they lease, and they do their own sampling to look at what they want. But their own boats being large ships. They're large ships that are leased. Yeah. They're owned by consortia, and yeah. they're leased out so that they're out every, all the time, and they they make good use of their time. Yeah, because you need a crew, you need to keep it up, and so forth. It's a big, it's a big deal, and often multiple groups go on one ship, right? Yep. Very, very interesting. Um, I we I think Steve Wilhelm talked a little bit about these expeditions on the TWIV we did at the giant virus meeting in, in 2018. Uh, but the Tara Oceans, I want to, I'll put a link uh, to that in the um, show notes. Um, they, um, it's just amazing. What 35,000 samples of viruses, algae, and plankton were collected and analyzed. The biggest genetic sequencing task ever take, undertaken on marine organisms. And there were five articles in May 2015 published in Science based on the initial findings there. And But since then, there have been 300 publications alone from people like this one, taking the data and uh, reanalyzing it. It's just very cool. And this organization, I mean, this particular expedition that produced this data set um, wrapped up in 2013, but the Terra Ocean organization and their boat uh, it appears, are still very active in yeah. in operations and doing all kinds of uh, of other cool stuff. So definitely a site worth checking out. It's pretty cool that you can go on a boat to do your science, isn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> right. Now for more mundane things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something it's, simpler like the immune system. Let's talk about. That. I mean, it's. <laughs> It just, it's important, but uh, it's not the same. It's I, exciting. It's exciting. It is ex- yeah, it's a this very is, interesting um, paper. This is a journal preproof in Cell, and it is entitled, The T-Cell-Directed Vaccine, BNT162B4, 
encoding conserved non-spike antigens protects animals from severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, should be disease. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. It's not a severe infection. It's not. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are several places where I'm going to make corrections here to things like that. Yeah, it protects them against severe disease. And um, this is coming from BioNTech. Or um, Beyond Tech. Beyond Tech. Sorry, I always get that wrong. That's it, Yeah, the BNT162B4, they're really good with the snappy product names at Beyond mm -hmm. Tech. Beyond Tech, <laughs> yes. in, which has an office in Cambridge and Mainz, Germany. And then we have uh, the, the, the uh, Johannes Gutenberg University. We have one, two, three. Three, co for, three co first authors. Christina Arietta, Yushu Joy Shi, and Daniel Rothenberg. And then the correspondence goes to uh, Christina Arietta and Asaf Koran, who is um, the last author and the lead contact. The second last author is uh, Richard Gaynor, and he was a fellow in Arnie Burke's lab when I was a postdoc there. Wow. So Very cool. cool. So this is about, uh, you know, making a T-cell vaccine that we've talked about for a long time. <clears throat> this is quite interesting, and it's, in fact, in a clinical trial right now. So we should be hearing uh, more about that. And, um, you know, I, I think it, the background in the, in, the dis, in the introduction is very good. And so let's point out some of the highlights. Um, and another um, yep. two things, another open access paper, and you mentioned highlights, so I'll just point out since this is a pre-proof, uh, it has cells, very annoying PDF habit that if, uh, at least on my PDF reader, if I try to highlight something, it highlights instead the journal pre-proof. Oh, yes. Uh, and I, re I remove all those. <laughs> I remove them well, in Acrobat because you can edit the PDF okay. and get rid okay, of them. I don't have Acrobat, but oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. because the journal pre-proof watermark covers up... Um, important part of almost every figure that yeah, too the figure i leave but the text which i want to highlight as alan said if you if you try and highlight it just highlights this diagonal highlights diagonally across the page you can get the oh that uh, you can highlight text in the top of the page and down near the bottom of the page but where it's emblazoned yeah. with journal pre-proof in the background you can't highlight yeah, so that's that my properly. solution is i go through the five or six pages okay. and remove them you end up removing one or two letters here and there but it's not a big deal and okay. now i can highlight so that I can provide for listeners a uh, comprehensible, uh, comprehensible, whatever uh, account of the paper. Comprehensible is good. Comprehensible. Yes. Uh, one thing that I that stood out to me right from the beginning when I was looking at the title is, um, as Alan said, that uh, Biontech makes some very snappy named uh, products, um, and so BNT one six two B two is the name of the current right. Pfizer uh, vaccine. Yeah. And so this is uh, different than that current spike vaccine that was in my arm, has been in my arm, um, BNT162B4. So this is, you can already start to think about maybe like a newer version. Right. 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 So, so the B2, B2 and B4 is how we could refer to these in this yeah. picture. Right. But you're going to get B4 so B2, after B2. B2 is the spike encoding <laughs> MRI exactly. and before yes. is the now the T cell epitope encoding that we're going to talk about here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which it's too bad it has before because that. I know. <laughs> yes. No, that's, yeah. If it was B five, it'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah. B note that B two does have some T cell epitopes. It yeah, has all the T cell epitopes in spike. In spike. Yes, totally. Um, and we're going to talk so. about those. Yeah. So they say right at the beginning, right? Omicron has is immunovasive. You know, many antibodies uh, don't neutralize it, but the vaccines, encoding spike, are still effective at protecting from severe disease by both antibody, non-neutralizing antibody mechanisms, and cell-mediated mechanisms. And so maybe we should think about putting more uh, cellular antigens uh, in, in the vaccine. Could help. And they have a nice discussion of uh, T cells, two different kinds of T cells, the CD4s that are important for helping other parts of the immune response and the CD8s that kill or lice uh, virus-infected cells. Uh, and they say, this is very interesting, neutralizing antibody levels in the SARS-1, the original SARS, OG SARS, antibody levels decay, but virus-specific T-cell memory persists for 17 years. We learned in Immune a few weeks ago that T-cells can live forever, right? <laughs> 
you must not have noticed my pick. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't noticed it yet. No. Yeah. Um, and in fact, a couple of interesting bits of information for SARS-CoV-2 depletion of CDA positive T cells in convalescent SARS-CoV-2 convalescent non-human primates reduced protection conferred by uh, natural immunity to rechallenge. I think we did that paper a long time ago. So again, uh, T cells are important. Um, and in addition, depleting T cells after immunization using spike or end protein also uh, in animals reduced protection uh, against challenge. So it's interesting. T cells, gee, T cells are important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, T cells may provide durable immunity. They're associated with a shortened course of disease. They're detected earlier than antibody responses. God, that's something we said a long time ago, remember? They do come up quicker than antibodies. And rapid, these cellular responses correlate with reduced disease severity. Okay, so all of this says cellular responses are important. Let's let's make a vaccine uh, that includes more cellular uh, epitopes. So they're going to include the N protein, the membrane, and the ORF open reading frame one AB ORF one AB, which they sell have the most T cell immunogenic uh, antigens. And these, by the way, are conserved across variants, right? These uh, T cell epitopes tend not to vary as do. Uh, the B cell epitopes in the spike protein. It might be convenient just to think about those other epitopes as MNO for M yes. membrane and for nucleocapsid and O for the ORF. Yeah, MNO. One and yeah. M -N -O. We might so need to, are, yeah. These are just more proteins from SARS CoV 2 that have good targets for T cells, good T cell epitopes. Um, yeah. So the idea is having them in addition to the spike. Epitopes. It's, it's right. and it's, epitopes I, yeah. We might want to note that this vaccine, it's not actually targeting the T cells. Um, it's not like aiming at them or using anything special to get to the T cells. It's just these are epitopes that are going to be expressed in the muscle cells where you get the shot. And what's going to respond to them is the T cells. And yeah. that's that's the the antigen yeah, so that's going to actually get things so done. Past studies have looked at people who were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and looked at which parts of the virus T cells happen to recognize well mm. and have identified these as the parts of the virus that T cells uh, particularly recognize in addition right. to spike. So this um, vaccine, BNT162B4, was actually designed in September 2020. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, just that first year, and they said this is before all the variants began to emerge, and they, you know, use uh, they look at <clears throat> convalescent patients who and see what what kind of epitopes are T cell epitopes are in them, and so they decided to select these. What did you call it? NMO, NMO, yeah, NMO, yeah. NMO the uh, alphabet uh, <laughs> for the vaccine. They they um, selected different ways for the NM and, and O proteins, they end up having um, 18 sequence segments of nine to 16 amino acids uh, were selected. And this contains, so the, they put they put this in an mRNA, uh, which comprises BMT162B4. And in that, it has 2,257 unique, unique predicted peptide HLA1 pairs across 105 HLA1 alleles and 1,992 unique predicted HLA2 pairs across HLA 70 HLA2 alleles. Um, so, Debrion, explain HLA1 and yeah, 2 in the context of the, okay. of the peptides, please. So, with the uh, spike containing vaccine, that vaccine contains all of spike, the, uh, the mRNA that encodes the entire spike protein. Here, they're not taking the um, material to encode all of M, all of N, and all of O. Instead, they're picking parts of M, N, and O. And the way that they're choosing which parts to choose are that they're looking at patients and they're looking to see which parts are bound by their MHC proteins and shown to T cells. So they can find that certain portions of N, for example, are frequently bound by MHC. 
either class one or class two. And so they've made a string of all of the little parts of N that could bind to different class ones and all of the parts of M and all of the parts of O. So this doesn't encode the entire N, the entire M, or the entire O. It's just little segments that bind to the MHC. Um, and that's what T cells tend to see are those little segments yeah. bound to MHC. So when you And the importance of HLA haplotypes is we've all got different HLA haplotypes. So yeah. you want to make sure that your vaccine isn't just going to work in some segments of the population. It'll yeah. actually work in everybody. So HLA1 is on all cells, right? Yes. And that will present these so the, the mRNA will get into cells, it'll make a protein, which will then be chopped up into peptides by the proteasome, right? Mm -hmm. And then loaded into MHC1. Yep. Uh, and or, so cytoplasmic uh, peptides. And then uh, HLA1 on all cells, and then HLA2 on antigen-presenting cells like macrophages and dendritic cells, right? Specialized Correct. cells. Uh, and so now they, they, and then they look at all these peptides that they've designed and then they say, what do the variants have? Are there changes in these peptides? And there are only four non-synonymous uh, changes across all the variants um, and two non-synonymous from Omicron as of December 2022. So basically, these peptides they've designed are not changing in the variants in a significant way. Right. So the first thing... And, and know that that four is out of 2,257 predicted um, class one pairs and 1,992 class two yeah. pairs. Yeah. So four is Nothing. not a very significant number out of all those. So, no. Yeah. So essentially these changes in the variants are not going to impact the um, effectiveness of these peptides to, uh, to generate T cells, activate T cells. And since these are essential non-structural proteins in the virus, it, it is likely that there's a that there are strict limits on the amount that the virus could even change these before being unable to replicate. It's both like, that's exactly right. And as you mentioned before, because we all are responding to slightly different versions, uh, different peptides, since we all have different HLAs, there's also less overall selective pressure. We're all right. selecting for different variants. And so if we think about the population level, there's no one change that is being selected in everybody's body. Right. Okay. So th then they said, do these work? <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we're, if we really want to get to. Yeah. <laughs> step, step one, do they work in cells? Are these, pro is the protein that's made or encoded in this mRNA, is it processed in a cell? And do you see the right peptides bound to HLA1? And I think two as well, they look at here, maybe just one in this study. So they put the mRNA into cells and culture. It's a, it's a cell line with a known HLA allele. And then they use mass spectroscopy to ask, what are the peptides that are now on the surface of these cells uh, being displayed, right? Is that fair, uh, Brianne? Is that, that, is is that fair? fair? No, not fair. Correct is the right word. That it's it's as correct as as I could say. It's yeah, not so. fair to the virus at all. <laughs> so they can see <laughs> that the whole mRNA is translated. They see peptides across the whole open reading frame, and this makes peptides that are presented on these HLA on the surface of the cell for immune recognition. So it's working. They get the protein. It's processed, and it's binding uh, HLA. Okay. Yeah. And you were asking if it's class one or class two. It's specifically class one and a specific type of class one called HLA A201. It's a certain haplotype, right? Yeah. Yep. So it's just class one. Because that's the one that's on most cells, right? And so it's the one that there's a really nice antibody against to use for this. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> yes. Good. Uh then they put these in mice. Uh they put the, the vaccine into into mice and look at uh, CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. Um, and so what they do is they immunize mice. So they put, now they make a lipid nanoparticle with the mRNA, right? They make a, a vaccine and they immunize mice, which, ha which make a certain human uh, HLA, right? So it's, I guess it's a trans, it's a transgenic it's, it's, mouse. It's yeah. the same one. It's the same one. It's HLA0201. <laughs> okay. The same as we saw in the cell line, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they immunize them with uh, different amounts of this uh, B4. Uh, and then they take T cells 
from those mice and they analyze their responses. They look at interferon gamma production, which is one uh, assay of activation, right, Brianne? Mm -hmm. And LE spot. Um, the LE spot is for interferon gamma, right? Right. And then they do flow cytometry to look at uh, certain cytokines that are produced or... Yeah, yeah. so they're looking for um, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, IL-2, and they're also looking for um, surface uh, expression of a protein called CD107A, which is part of the um, cytotoxic granule. Mm -hmm. So when a cytotoxic granule is released, um, this protein ends up being on the surface of the cell. I, I'm not going to go through the details, but I like this one analysis called mesoscale discovery. MSD, did you see that? I did. Okay, so basically they they use a couple of different mouse models and they find that in all of them that you get after you immunize the mice, you get T cell responses against the the MN and Os which with different MHC backgrounds and you get polyfunctional T cells, right? Um and and this is what they say this is uh, similar to what we've seen before with B2 vaccine. The same yes. kinds of polyfunctional T cells are made. And polyfunctional T cells are important because they don't just make interferon gamma. They do interferon gamma and other things. They have multiple functions in one T cell. Right. And then next they look at um, uh, antibody titers. They want to make sure that this is not interfering with antibodies made against the spike, right? Neutralizing antibodies. So they're giving now B2 and B4 together. And they find that there's no inhibition of uh, B2 induced neutralizing antibodies, which is good. You don't want that to happen. Is there some reason to think, Brianne, that that could happen? I mean, I only the only thing I could think about is maybe because you're sort of playing with the doses of one, or maybe I guess if the T cells started to come up early, they might eliminate the antigen presenting cell before you could get a good antibody response. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure that I would have expected them to see reductions, but you certainly have to check. Okay. Reviewer number three would certainly expect yes. it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then they say, okay, a, a lot of people in the world have gotten spike, right? Either by vaccinating or, inf or infecting. So is there, is there going to be a problem if we now give them before? Will there be any issues? So they reproduce that in mice. They, they immunize them with, uh, B2 vaccine, the spike encoding mRNA vaccine, and then they give them, um, you know, either control just the vehicle or different amounts of B4. So can you give B4 after? <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very. Just to be clear. <laughs> just to be clear. Can you give B4 after? Yes. And there's no problem that you get similar levels of neutralizing antibodies, you get similar T cell responses against spike, right? Um, and um, so the third, a, a dose of four, um, you get, you actually get broader T cells, which is of course what you expect because you're getting, you're including NM and O uh, antigens in there, but there's no problem with having, giving, uh, immunized already with B2. That's good. Which also makes sense, but again, you have to check. You have to check. Right. You have to check. Because, I mean, the the immune system doesn't know that these are parts of the same virus. It just, oh, here's an antigen to respond to. Oh, here's an antigen to respond to. So Now, when, when T cells are, are recognizing these peptides, as we've said, displayed in uh, MHC molecules, and the T cell has a T cell receptor. Right, which Brianna, each T cell receptor recognizes one peptide, correct? It it does. Yes. So we can talk about uh, you mentioned the the breadth of T cells before. Yeah. And one way you could think about breadth has to do with how many different T cell receptors are there. Do you right. which epitopes do you recognize? So you can do that by sequencing RNA sequencing of the T cells, and you can say, ah, this these T cells have all these different T cell receptors. Right. Well, you can also determine if you look within all of the T cells that bind to a particular epitope, you could say, do they all have one kind of T cell receptor at the sequence level? Yeah. Or is there even another level of variation? Mm -hmm. um, 
on top. And so that's kind of what they're doing here is they're, they saw breadth at the level of hitting lots of epitopes, but now is there breadth in multiple ways to get to the receptor that hits lots of epitopes? So the, the way the experiment is done, you immunize mice and they use either the spike alone or uh, spike and um, NMO. Uh, and then they get T cells out of the spleen from these mice. And then they, they select T cells that are making a, a specific, uh, that they select uh, cells that have a specific peptide uh, using tetramers, right? Yep. So they're, they're selecting cells that make all make one, like the same kind of T cell receptor, a T cell right. receptor that binds to one kind of antigen. And then they sequence the genes encoding that T cell receptor right, right. to see if there's diversity in the um, genetic coding for that T cell receptor. If there were more than one ways to make that genetic code. So um, the way they do this, the tetramer has MHC bound to a peptide, right? Mm -hmm. And then that will pull out T cells that recognize the peptide. Correct. Exactly. Right. And then they can sequence, as you said, the the T cell and see um, what kind of uh, T cell receptors there. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to give you the summary <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there's no need to go through all the, the details. Uh, basically, these results indicate the phenotype and functionality of the spike specific T cells is maintained when the uh, you give the B2 alone or together with before because we're looking at spike specific here right and so it doesn't change with before would you expect it to maybe you would i don't know i could come up with some really picky reasons but not it wouldn't be my first thought no okay all right now let's go into animals and do a challenge golden syrian hamster challenge model we they immunize them with uh, before alone or together with B2, different ratios. And then we challenged them intranasally with the Washington strain of SARS-CoV-2 from 2020, right? The a really early, before any uh, variants have emerged. And I think you called it OG. 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 <laughs> Except that confuses it with OG SARS-CoV. But... Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, then we measure disease severity. So disease severity, we're not measuring infection, we're measuring disease severity, right? Weight loss, viral titers, tissue pathology in the lungs. Um, so BNT2, B2, the spike only vaccine, you get protection uh, from disease. No, there's lack of weight loss, very little virus in the lung and the uh, nasopharynx. And this is an experiment that had been done before, of course. Of course. If you give animals B, B2 and B4, they're also protected. Um, negligible viral titers in the lungs and the turbinates. B4 alone, you got protection, but not as much as with uh, B2 or B2 and B4. Um, and, oh, let's see. <laughs> okay, so basically, they both are protecting against uh, severe disease um, in, in these animal models. So B2 alone or B2, B2 plus B4. B4 alone, a little less, but I guess you'd expect that because um, you're not generating neutralizing antibodies, right? Right. You're not targeting spike making those yeah. good antibody responses. But it's interesting that B4 alone is, is protective to a certain extent, right? Yeah, because T cells are awesome. Yeah, yeah. they are. <laughs> they are. Everything is awesome, Brienne. Everything is awesome. I know. <laughs> well, okay, not every, we got that earworm. <laughs> not everything, I guess. All right. What about variants? <sighs> So they, they immunize with B2 uh, alone, B4 alone, or together. They challenge with intranasal delta and uh, or BA1, Omicron BA1. <clears throat> so delta, you get reduced uh, titers in the lung and turbinates. Com in animals that get both two and four compared to animals with two alone. So two, four does better with delta than two alone. It doesn't seem to really change severity of disease, 
right? Yeah, just titers, right? Just titers. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, just compared to Delta and Wild. To, oh, okay, yeah. And then Omicron BA one lower pathogenicity, but we already know that, and there's not much of a difference <laughs> um, with two alone and two plus four, right? Less note. The, the differences in the titers are less notable among uh, groups um, because Omicron already is not. Remember from our our discussion with Mosan Saeed, uh, Omicron is quite attenuated in mice to begin with. Right. It's not and hamsters. And hamsters. <clears throat> um, but they say that these data suggest that immunity raised by B4 could be protective against symptoms caused by multiple viral variants of SARS CoV 2. So, yes. So it's true that um, there there is protection, but it's not clear to me that <laughs> putting B4 in, in these two cases is any better, right? I guess the Delta bit was better. The yeah, combination was better, but there, there seems to be a little difference in viral titers yeah. in some variants, and I'm not seeing a disease difference. And this is this is immunization, and then infection shortly after. This is not waiting some period of months and then doing the infection. Yeah, th yeah. yeah that's the key, right? These are how many weeks after? How, how long after immunization? Let's see. Um, seven days post, no, that's the, the, the looking at, they're immunized and challenged two weeks after immunization. So everything is at peak, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the T cells and the B and the B cells are all at peak. So you really want to know that what happens, what, six months later, how, in a mouse, what would you do a couple of months maybe? Yeah, I'd probably, I would do at least six months. I, but I think six, uh, I would do at least two months, but I think six months would be a nice experiment. Um, I'd also love to know how many of these epitopes are conserved more broadly in some of the other coronaviruses. Yeah. Um, to think about how um, broad of the protection you might get with this. Yeah. And I would also kind of wonder what happens if you do a, a proper three dose booster series. Mm -hmm. Especially these... one that's going to be like 60 days apart, like in the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, because if you look at real world ways that the vaccine has already been delivered, people have gotten B2 or the Moderna equivalent or whatever, um, and they did their hopefully at least two doses and preferably three, because um, we think of this, I think of this now as a three dose vaccine, uh, and then six months later, get infected. How do these compare? Right. So it's currently in, in humans. Uh, there's a clinical trial. You could look it up. There's a number here. I did. I want to tell you a little about tell it. Tell us about it. Yeah. So they, it's mostly phase one, so it's just safety. And they're going to give bivalent 30 micrograms. And they're first going to start off with five micrograms of the B4 for participants aged 18 to 55. And then they'll check how that goes. And if it's going okay, they'll give it, they'll give the 10 microgram of B4, they'll, they'll double it. And then they'll give 15 micrograms of B4. And then depending on how all that's going, they'll open it up to participants older than 55 years. And these are participants who may or may not have been vaccinated with B2 or the, Moderna. This or... is what I was just about to say, okay. which is they don't specify anything about criteria for the participants. So whether they had a natural infection, did they have any previous immunizations? They don't say anything about that. Okay. So this That's is going to be a diverse pool, I would expect, because yeah. if you had vaccination and then infection or infection and then vaccination, and you've, your immune system may or may not have seen MNO. Right. So this is spike. just before they're giving them, is that correct? They're giving everybody B2, 30 micrograms, plus okay, okay. 5, 10, or 15 micrograms of B4. And, the B2, and that's, what they, that's the bivalent. Yeah, the B2 is from some Omicron variant, right? Because B4 doesn't matter. It's all the same pretty much, right? I think B2 is the is specifically the name of the original. I think so, too. All right, so it's not a bivalent. Uh, wait, okay, here it says, I, I take it back. 
162B2 bivalent parentheses original slash Omicron ah. BA4 point BA.4 slash BA.5. So it's what so, you can currently get. So, right. so it's two so it's mRNA. Apparently, this whole thing's a trivalent. Spikes. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. So this yeah. this would be a tri, well tetravalent if you count MNO as three different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So B is the original uh, vaccine. Then B B two is the bivalent, right? right? And then okay. before is the T cell epitope. Okay, got it. Right. Um, and then I, what I is the? This is just a safety thing. So there's no readout correct. of disease or anything. Well, they they have. Um, they're probably going to look they, at They have outcome measures, um, uh, local reactions at injection site, adverse events, uh, events, serious adverse events, abnormal hematology, ECGs, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So so they have those as part of their safety. But, but they're second, not looking at second, antibody or... Secondary outcome, geometric mean titers at each time point, um, neutralizing titers and... Uh, against ancestral strain and Omicron neutralizing titers, um, sero response at each time point, and geometric mean fold rises from baseline for each cohort. Right. Uh, yeah. So let let me let's oh. read. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, it says eligibility criteria. I didn't see that before. Um, are healthy. Agree not to enroll in another trial, not to be agree not to be vaccinated with non-trial vaccines except COVID nineteen vaccines as per next sub bullet. Um, no vaccines until one hundred eighty days after receiving the last IMP dose. Uh, have been vaccinated with at least three doses of an RNA based COVID nineteen vaccine authorized in the U S. before visit zero. So, oh, that's, so they, okay, that's so they definitely criteria. want people who've gotten yes. a spike okay. vaccine. Sorry, I didn't find that earlier. Sorry. Right. Um, yeah, an exclusion is breastfeeding, history of severe adverse reactions, some other medical conditions, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long list of exclusions, mm -hmm. but the inclusion is they want evidently people who've been vaccinated with at least three doses of an and our, of an RNA based COVID nineteen okay, vaccine that's, so authorized that's a, in the I mean, US. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a realistic Yes. That will give us real world information. Yeah. Uh, let me let me summarize the animal study. So yes, sorry. <laughs> so the challenge with the original uh virus before any variants, either being B two or B two plus B four both equally protected against severe disease, right? Hyper inflammation, weight loss, et cetera. But when you look at Delta, then the two together are better than B2 alone. And with a little bit, yeah. A little bit. With the Omicron, there's not much because it's already mild uh, and the differences are, are even less notable. Okay. So the I, and so basically, we, because this is two weeks out, we don't know what would happen, um, you know, a few months out, which I think would be interesting. Or with, other variants that are further diverged, right? I just mm -hmm. don't know because or already, with a three dose series. I mean, already the current vaccine still protects well against uh, severe disease, except in certain very, very vulnerable people, and maybe in them the, the extra T cell epitopes would be good. Maybe in all of us, but we're going to have to know by doing a trial with uh, as phase two and three, where there's circulating virus causing disease, right? Uh, that's the thing. I mean, we've always said on. To have that more T cell epitopes would be good. So this is what we want, right? But you also get more T cell epitopes with an infection, right? You do. You do. Um, but there you're getting the entire M and an O. Yeah. Um, and so if they have, you know, other effects, you got to deal with that. Yeah. As well as the other effects the fact of that, the yes, whole virus yes, you could and get it sick. is going to have right. severe, the, potentially severe complications. Yeah. Right. So for people who have been mostly... It's just, what I'm getting at is it's kind of a hard sell. It's kind of difficult to sell an incremental improvement in a vaccine that's 90% efficacious against severe disease already. I understand. But for um, people who are immunized for the first time who haven't been infected, that might be... First time, useful. first time immunization and immunocompromised or other yeah. highly vulnerable populations. I think that's the clinical trial that ultimately 
you want to work up to. Obviously, you have to do the phase one first, make sure this is safe. Do some kind of a larger trial in a wider population, make sure it's really safe. And then hopefully get to the more vulnerable populations where you can ask a question like, are they better protected than they were with the B2? So I have a question for Brianne, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it clear or state it. But I've understood that if we've gotten immunized against spike and we get more and more immunizations against spike, we might be in a condition where if we got an infection, we might not make measurable levels of antibodies to N because of, I think, original antigenic sin. Sort of, yeah. And so if we've gotten all these immunizations to spike and we've made T cell responses to spike, are we also going to be precluded from making subsequent responses to M, N, and the ORF 1AAB because of that? In other words, is there a sort of an antigenic sin with respect to T cells? Hmm. Um, I could imagine a way that the answer is yes, but I don't specifically know the data. Okay. <laughs> and my understanding of original antigenic sin is that it would apply to similar antigens and MN and O are not like Spike. No, but they're right. like each other and... Right. So you mean if you got one M... Would that give you later original antigenic sin against a varied M? I guess. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I didn't mm. really state my Is question. Is that what that. your yeah. question was? That was how I took your question anyway. Yeah. That's fine. That's how you answered it. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So right, it, but so your your response to spike is not going to affect your response to M, which to your immune system is a totally different antigen. Right. Yes. Well, that's that's what I thought the, I understood from Daniel the, is that if you've that you're not going to show a strong N antibody response if you've already made and so, been exposed to. But S isn't that antigen. because your immune system is taking the virus out too quickly for it? to Basically, yeah. So the, yeah. So the idea oh, right. here is that you make an immune response to spike. Right then there is a cell that gets infected with the virus, which has both spike and M and N and all the things. And all of those could be presented to make T cells to the whole smorgasbord. Um, the memory T cells that you've already made or the memory B cells that make ant good levels of antibodies are going to work so fast that all of those other antigens won't be seen. Right. Is the issue that you're mentioning. And okay. so, yeah, the the I can again, I can imagine a caveat to all of this, um, but I would need some data before I could fully um, go down that rabbit hole. Okay. But okay. this uh, B4 could be a good answer to that that would introduce your body to, oh, here are these other antigens in the absence of spike. Yeah. That would then. Um, cause perhaps a response and in fact in that case it might actually be better to do just the b4 vaccine rather than the b2 plus b4 but i doubt they're gonna get to that i don't know that's not part of the trial right kathy no that's right, right. so um <laughs> if if you've been multi vaccinated and then you got infected you probably have a really good t-cell repertoire already well you probably at least have a really good spike t-cell repertoire yes but you're arguing that because the immunity dampened the infection so quickly you may not have a great non t it's perhaps spike. yeah perhaps perhaps yes so if this vaccine and i'm sure that moderna and others are going to make this similar vaccines if it's safe and if it protects against severe disease as well as spike alone i i assume it will be licensed and then we will see as variants continue to evolve how it does and whether it's necessary to change the formulation um, when we have this before incorporated with B2, right? That's how I see it moving forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the other big question would be about the longevity of the immune response. Right, right, which 
is hard to know because as Daniela said, we're going to get infected every year. Yeah. So who knows? But maybe that's part of longevity too, right? I don't know. Um, so uh, I'm trying to give people a clear message here. <clears throat> so the, the real issue will be maybe eliminating the need to give a booster, uh, a spike only booster every year would be the outcome of using this because the T cells combined with the non-neutralizing protective functions of the, of the antibodies induced by spike might be enough to prevent severe disease, right? You could kind of think of it as a more of a universal vaccine if it's to these yeah. epitopes that are found in more types. Yeah. But as, as and <laughs> I think the question of whether the response was cross-reactive with other coronaviruses entirely mm -hmm. is a really cool one because if you could give B4 as a uh, maybe not a pan coronavirus vaccine, but a, a segment of coronaviruses vaccine, that'd be good. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, we'll see. What, it's going to be a while before we know what happens in people. Yeah. But there, there was one, let's see, I think there was one thing I wanted to point out here. Um, well, all right. So ba I can't find it all, but basically this one, it says, um, They're talking about protection in the upper respiratory tract because we do see protection in the in the nasopharynx or the nasal turbinates of uh, the animals in this study. And they say the um, protection in the upper tract offered by the addition of B4 is particularly attractive as it could point to a potential for a decreased transmission rate. So I, again, if you look at two weeks post immunization, it's giving you a false picture of of upper track protection because the I antibody think. levels are high and they're not going to stay high yeah antibody the t-cell levels presumably also right so i think you have to be careful the i know they say potential for decrease so that's good at least they yeah. say potential so because they say potent memory t-cell responses activated rapidly following infection would likely mean less time for intra-host viral spread and activation of immune evasion mechanism yeah so i i think we just have to see right but it, that's very yep. interesting. And this could be, uh, you know, the future vaccine with these T-cell epitopes or maybe with some others that other people, I, I guess this, these are the ones you would use, uh, Brianne, because these are the ones that... Uh, so that's my first thought of those being the ones you could use. I also, you know, maybe someday in the future, um, this could be a vaccine that kids got as their first exposure. Right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then you grow up and you're... And you grow up and you have memory to both memory B and memory T responses right. getting primed. And then you're going to get infected every year and you're going to get boosted and, and you'll move into old age with plenty of memory B and T cells and you you likely not get severe disease anymore. Yeah. Right? And might it also for future not yet emerged viruses that could become pandemics give you clues as to how you might want to start addressing, preparing vaccines. Yeah. Instead of just making yeah. spike, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, it, or whatever it is in that virus. That's the most antigenic for, yeah. Yeah. Spike hemagglutinin. Well, the, uh, right now the flu vaccines do have some non spike T cell epitopes, right? They have nuclear protein M protein. I don't know how much is actually in those vaccines. I think it's mostly HA and NA. Right. But I guess, you know, if we're going to have mRNA vaccines for for influenza virus, then including maybe you don't just do HA, right? Does anyone remember what uh, Scott, is that his name? Scott. Um, it was Scott Hensley, but I don't remember what he said. Did he have just HA or did he have NA too? I think it was just, it's just HA. Did a lot of different HAs, but maybe you want to put in some... Uh, other T cell epitopes, right? Which I'm sure are well known also for flu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you could get, if you could make this into a universal flu vaccine, that would be. Um, or a universal corona. Or universal corona. But talking of flu vaccines, I mean, I'm thinking about getting, um, when I get a flu shot every year, if I'm going to go through another round of Moderna flu every year, uh, 
I'd rather not. Um, <laughs> so, so if these mRNA vaccines, the, the side effect profile for them is, is um, for a lot of people pretty unpleasant, um, more so than other than many other vaccines like the annual flu shot that's not mRNA based. Uh, so, but if you're going to make it a universal flu vaccine and you only have to get it three shots worth, then that might be a really good deal. I think we should get away with the annual flu shot. We should make a better vaccine. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we should we should have we should get a universal flu vaccine so yeah. we don't have to have an annual flu well, shot. And and couldn't you also just envision your flu vaccine as having or your newly emerged virus vaccine having T cell epitopes, not necessarily on an mRNA platform? Oh yeah, sure. You you could, but mRNA is particularly attractive for the T cells apitopes because it's getting you MHC class one. It's expressed in the cells, yeah. Right. Mm. Mm, yeah. If you let's say you had a protein uh, T cell vaccine, uh, then it would have to be taken up by APCs, right? Mm -hmm. A little less efficient. Is that the idea? Definitely less efficient. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing like infecting a cell to get. The epitopes on the surface, right? Um, what, one, so one last thing: people always write and say, "Why? What's wrong with getting a COVID booster every year? We get a flu booster every year." And I, I would rather get away from that, right? I don't think we have to. If we could make a universal for both, yeah, it would make nice because I think a lot of people don't get immunized because they have to do it every year. They just don't want every, to. Do it. The the annual flu shot is a a. Uh, long-standing sticking point in immunization and especially in adult immunization. I mean, come on, every freaking year you got to go get that thing and <laughs> yeah. and it's it's fall and it's busy and I'll get around to it when I feel like it and oh yeah. my gosh, yeah. I'm feeling ill all of a sudden. I should have gotten my flu shot. Um, and also the annual flu shot, I mean, yeah, I get it, but it's the it's the least effective vaccine in general use. I mean, it's the from year to year, it's like 40%, yeah. 60% maybe. Um, so yeah, we would absolutely like to have a universal flu vaccine. And as I said, the idea of an annual mRNA shot, based on my experience and the experiences of other people I know who've had horrible reactions to the mRNA vaccines, and I'm sure that's inherent to the platform. It's not It's not going to be SARS-CoV-2 specific. Um that's not something that people are going to want to do every year. No, once upon a time last year, we did, Vincent and I, I remember, talked about that IL-1 receptor alpha mm. paper. And that that was not SARS-CoV-2 specific. And that yeah. was behind a lot of those effects. Yeah. Also, people say, um, the, the thought is left. So why can't, oh, so for flu, we know we need to have an updated vaccine. Otherwise, we get severe disease yes but it's not clear that an updated covid is really needed for protection right against severe disease except in certain populations maybe you know immunosuppressed or over 105 years old i mean 75 years old <laughs> but even then well, all right well so oh by the way speaking of vaccines the rsv vaccine a rsv vaccine was approved yes. by fda yesterday right big news that's big cool news so kathy and i are gonna go get it <laughs> right or, or maybe you know, not maybe not run right out and get it but oh we'll you know, i asked daniel if he was and he said i'm on i'm under 60 i didn't know he was under 60 <laughs> so it's 60 and up so there's uh, some caveats I, well, I thought it was 65 and up but okay whatever uh maybe yeah, daniel 60. and i are the same generation you are yeah everybody yeah, right. uh, we're gen <laughs> xers you're lucky we even showed up <laughs> I, i'm also a gen xer I know. technically yeah, yes yeah you're like at the two weeks. you're at the bottom end of it so yeah. explain that so gen xers don't care they just Ge Jennifer, generation we're the lone wolves we don't we don't collaborate a lot no. is the reputation okay and we also we also tend to you know get left out of stuff and we're, we're fine with that gen x but okay. don't you forget about us let's do some picks of the week, Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I've already kind of mentioned this. Um, I 
have a pick of our most recent immune episode. And the reason why is because I think that the paper we discussed in this episode um, about T cell memory and how long T cell uh, memory T cells can live is just fascinating. Um, I have had conversations with um, some friends who are cancer biologists um, about this paper. And I basically um, in this paper, they tried to look at giving serial boosts and how long they could get T cells to live. Um, and when they, they were doing boosts 60 days apart, I made a comment about 60 days earlier, um, and they could get um, those cells to live three times the length of, of the life of a mouse. <laughs> and these are cells from a mouse. And in fact, they started the experiment in 2012. The experiment was still ongoing in 2022 when they published it, and they still have these mice with these T cells still living, still going now. Amazing. Um, it, it's a really cool paper and it does have some cool implications for sort of cancer and for aging as well. And I, I've been talking about this paper kind of nonstop since I read it. So <laughs> I recommend anybody take a look at this paper. Um, and we talked about it on this episode of Immune. So T cells can live forever, but they don't always, right? Right. And especially for certain Im immunogens, they don't. And uh, that's the question, why not, is really important, right? Exactly. So, yes, it was a lot of fun. All right, Kathy, what do you have and, for And just a really, really cool experiment to oh, yeah. keep yeah. that going that long. And, well, and I mean, those cells are dividing more times than a cell is supposed to be able to divide. And the cell is doing cell cycle faster than the cell is supposed to be able to do cell cycle. And yeah. the cell is doing things with telomeres that are not supposed to happen. And so it's it's really cool. Yeah. Kathy, what do you have for us? I have a pick that... Never fear. I already told Dixon about this uh, because we know he won't listen to this and he won't even hear this pick. But I uh, was listening to BBC in the middle of the night. It's called The Forum BBC. And this particular episode was about Hazel Scott, who's from Trinidad, who's a jazz star, but she really broke barriers. Uh, she attended Juilliard when she was eight years old. She had to get an exception for that. It, they, you know, they, at first they were like, no, not no chance. And then they somehow got her in and uh, into the place and had her playing the piano. And then they said, oh, yeah, OK, we'll take you. So uh, anyway, and I was trying to find my additional notes about her, but I can't at the moment. Um, uh, she was active in civil rights things, which was pretty neat. And she was married to a famous person, which is why I'm trying to find my notes and I can't find them at the moment as to who she was married to, but um, you would recognize that person's name. Anyway, uh, really, really good jazz artist who trained in classical music, hence Juilliard, and then uh, became a jazz star. So that's pretty cool. And then just when you land on this page, the previous episode is about 1918 Spanish flu and the next one is mm. about the California gold rush. So I also put in the link for the forum BBC archive, which has 737 epitopes, not <laughs> as many as a thousand five, but uh, still is pretty That's a interesting. lot. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yes. Well, we got to keep going. We can't let them catch up. Nope. She married um, Congressman Adam Clayton Powell. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Adam Clayton Powell. I remember him. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are the old days. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a book I read uh, a little while ago, but um, I, I actually I had a different book initially in as a pick. I don't know if anybody saw it, but that'll be a future pick. Um, and I, I was looking at uh, the paper, the snippet for today's episode. I said, ah, this is the episode to pick The Last mm -hmm. Navigator. Um, this is a really neat read. Uh, it's by um, Steve Thomas, who's a who's a good writer. Um, who was uh, he's he's had a a multifaceted career, but for quite a while he was um, a circumnavigator and and captain of small boats. Um, did a lot of ocean sailing back in the pre GPS days. So he was navigating with a sextant, and he went to. Um, uh, what is the name of the island? It's in, it's in the Yap archipelago. Hmm. Um, and he went to one of the islands that's not the main 
island that's one of the, the sub islands you actually, I think at the time, maybe even still needed a special permit to even go there. Um, but he, he went there to apprentice with uh, this fellow Mao Piailug, who um, was one of the last traditional nav traditionally trained navigators in Micronesia. Mm. And um, traditionally trained, so the, the Polynesians um, settled a quarter of the earth by the time of the birth of Christ. Um, it is one of the most spectacular accomplishments in human history because with Stone Age technology, they navigated between islands across the Pacific, which is the toughest navigational problem. I mean, if you're navigating from the from Europe to the Americas, like Christopher Columbus, you just kind of sail west and you're going to hit something. If you're navigating from um, Yap to, uh, <laughs> I don't know, Fiji, and you miss it, you're going to be gone a long time because there's nothing out there. <laughs> um, and this this is the the ancient knowledge. And, and one of the things he does in the book at P.I. Lug's insistence is he includes a lot of what used to be forbidden knowledge passed down from from navigator to navigator through oral tradition. But Bialug is, is rightly concerned that this is all going to be lost when another generation passes on and, and the young folks don't want to learn this stuff because the newfangled technology does it for them. Um, so it's got all of that in a series of appendices, but it's this whole, it's this whole um, set of knowledge of when certain stars rise and set in certain seasons and how to read the ocean currents and the whole celestial navigation without a sextant. Um, it's just really, really cool. And it's a, it's a whole culture built around that, that he was allowed to have a front row seat to and cool. a really good read, whether you sail or not. Wow. That's a good way to learn something, isn't it? Nice. Yeah. All right. My pick is a, uh, a post by Paul Offit. He's been now recently posting on a forum called Substack, pulloffit.substack.com. And he writes uh, more or less every week about various topics, vaccines, testing, so forth. And my pick is um, his latest called Nasal Spray COVID Vaccines, Hope or Hype? <laughs> a closer look at Biden's $5 billion project next gen. Part, oh, part one. There's going to be more. So. You know, part of the five billion is to develop nasal spray vaccines, which will block infection and block transmission. Right. So he says, well, first of all, the vaccines we have are really good still at protecting against severe illness, at least for a few years. So what do we expect from a nasal vaccine? You're going to get local immunity. But he says caution should reign because just like antibodies everywhere else, they're going to go down eventually in the nasal mucosa. Uh, and uh, he says a few months after an intranasal vaccine, virus-specific EGA will also fade. And evidence for this limitation can be found in flu mist, nasal spray vaccine. Flu mist has been far from a game changer, failing to provide better or longer lasting protection against mild infections than influenza vaccines given as shots. So, you know, there's been a lot of hype about this and people are going to apply for that grant money and use it. I don't know if they're going to make anything that's any better. I mean, I would never say don't try, but please don't hype them as being. I'm sure a lot of them will do some good science. Maybe, uh, but don't say they're going to block infection and transmission because I think it, after a few months, it's highly likely to do that. But it seems to be, I don't, I don't get it. People are really excited about this, but you can't change the immune response. <laughs> so anyway, I like, I like that uh, take on it by Paul. All right, that is twist. I think sterilizing immunity is kind of the flying car of immunology. The flying car of immunology. Very it's good. It's like, yeah, we really want that. Yeah, we can really imagine it, but it's really, really hard to do. I don't know if it's even possible, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, <laughs> or you can get you can get something like you were saying, you know, for a couple of months, yeah, you can prevent transmission, but then, you know, you can make a car fly for a little while, but it's not practical. Yeah, you practical. could drop it off the back of a truck. Yeah, you can, you can drive it off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, that is TWIV 1005. I said it correctly. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work here on TWIV, we would love to have your financial support. We depend on you to uh, make this machine run. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for the various ways uh, you can help us out here. Kathy Spindler, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brian Barker, Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. I learned a lot. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com, alandove.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I just realized this is the first recording since uh, TWIV 1000, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Kind of getting back to the... Uh, to the old ways. Yeah, it's cool. I like doing this. <laughs> I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.